so uh, for this transient guest lodging community conversation, um, pretty much what this is is so we can get some feedback. Um, council is looking into changing some of the rules around transient guest lodging, and um, pretty much I just want to have a really great listening session to be able to kind of move forward and see what the community needs are um, when it comes to transient guest lodging and what are some of the concerns about rules changing, um, et cetera. Yes? Could you tell us what those rules are that they're looking at changing? Yeah, so... Um, Could you tell us what you want to do? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Kenetta Sanford, and I'm the new um, council member. I was appointed in December. Um, yeah. I'm AJ Williams. I'm here as a member of the Planning Commission and the Housing Advisory Board. Yeah. And so... Um, when it comes to the conversations that council has been having about transient guest lodging, um, one of the main things is, to me and to the rest of the council, is striking a balance between um, making sure that current uh, permit holders can continue their business. We know that this is a part, um, in part, something that really aids people who live in Yellow Springs to be able to stay here. Um, it's an affordability factor. Um, but on the flip side, thinking about losing apartments and single family homes, like more modest single family homes to investors and things like that who then flip it and turn it into transient guest lodging where we're losing out on current residents being displaced and the possibility for new residents to come in and find housing. So we really want to strike that balance, um, and in some cases, um, I, I believe the majority of people who are here live in Yellow Springs, um, but in some of the cases we're kind of looking at adding the rule of restricting um, transient guest lodging property to people who live in Yellow Springs, so I'd be getting new permits. Um, so that's a possibility moving forward, um, but also the possibility of um, having to live on the property where the transient guest lodging is. So that would be for new permits moving forward, um, whereas the current permits would be grandfathered in. Um, the only time that the, that grandfathered permit would end would be selling the property, um, and then that permit the new owner would have to get a new permit, which would have those restrictions on there. Um, so are there any questions about that or any concerns? I'd like to hear a little bit more about the philosophy of why you think that, that it needs to be changed. Is that the, the whole idea that especially, I mean, the, the one thing that you're restricting any future thing is single family homes that, or um, duplexes or whatever, that, the owner does not live on, on site. Um, the history of Yellow Springs and the housing prices, I've owned rental properties here for 15 years, mm -hmm. is that buying a new property now, you cannot afford to rent it for what the mortgage costs. Mm -hmm. The mortgage and taxes, you can't, you can't rent it for them. And, and it's not a, the single family homes are not going to be affordable rentals. They're just going to be sold as expensive houses. Mm -hmm. right? So they're not, you have the, the option of short-term rentals that will pay the mortgage, pay the taxes, pay the, the things, and bring people into town. Yellow Springs is a tourist town. Yeah. That our businesses and the reason we're thriving and not a Cedarville or a Jamestown or a Xenia is because of the tourist dollars coming in. And people coming in and staying short-term housing are bringing that, that money in. So I can totally see that perspective, um, especially thinking about the, like you mentioned, modest family, single family homes, if you try to rent it for an affordable rate, that that amount will not pay the mortgage and taxes. So, I mean, that's perspective that we want to hear in this, in this type of meeting. I do have a question now. The regulation says you amend them. Would you, uh, would they be tied to the current zoning so that Airbnbs might exist in one type of zoning without an on-site owner mm -hmm. living there in the property versus one um, where it's, um, you know, R1, for example. In other words, downtown, why would an owner need to live 
at an Airbnb that's downtown. Yeah, and so that's a business decision. Yeah, yeah. So uh, why would you require that? I was going to say that to me it seems significant to talk about does the owner live here in town somewhere or is it someone who lives in another city and is just buying yeah. up properties and mm -hmm. renting yeah. them on Airbnb. Yeah. That I really wouldn't care to see Yellow Springs go that road. But there's only two, what I've seen, two properties. So I see regulating that, but that's not my issue. When mm -hmm. there's only two properties, why hit it with a bat? It's an at. You know, but my issue is why would you want to regulate a downtown property that somebody owns? Maybe they rent the downstairs to a business and they want to use the upstairs for an Airbnb. Why would they have to live on the site? Yeah, and so that's where I mean, for that specific rule, kind of looking more at single family homes and things like that. Um, but that's that would be an issue where we would have to kind of look into that specifically because it wouldn't make sense if you have a one bedroom apartment that you're renting above a business to say, well, you know, I'm going to live here and rent this one bedroom up. You know, that would be something that we'd have to kind of pull out. I'm recommending that you look at that. Right. <laughs> um, my name is Kevin Sopes. I'm part of the Village Council also. Um, and just to speak to the question uh, relative to zoning, I mean, certainly zoning as a tool, uh, you know, making modifications in current uh, zoning districts, et cetera, it, it is a tool that could be used and probably would be used or, and modified in various circumstances. So, uh, I mean, nothing's hard and fast, but certainly, um, you know, those type of nuanced situations that you're referring to, you know, are where, you know, certain things would go one way or another. Um, you know, there's, you know, to, to, to Dan's point, um, if, I, if I would just simplify um, what you were saying, uh, taking into account your position in, in owning a, a property and trying to pay for it, um, I guess what I, when I started talking about this, I can, I will tell you a simple, it's, it is as simple as this. I wanted to stop what I saw happen. And what I saw was people that I knew, not just some <clears throat> resident, people who I knew, knew personally and worked with, um, who were asked to leave their home that they lived in for years. And <clears throat> uh, now that place that they were living, it, it was a long-term rental, is now a short-term rental. Um, and then they're forced, I'll be nice about it, they were asked, uh, you know, to go live somewhere else. And so when you look at the numbers, uh, and we, we, meet, we're, we all probably ought to agree that there's this premise that there might be somewhat of a housing shortage, you know, maybe not today, you know, maybe, you know, there's five people looking for houses and there's six available uh, places, but on the premise that there is a looming housing shortage, you know, when we take uh, living spaces off the market, you know, we're, we're going in, in reverse. So again, when it started, where people that I knew were asked to leave and then had to go find some place else, and what used to be a place where folks have lived in for years is now short-term rental. So there are different perspectives. You know, if I'm a property owner and I want to pay for that mortgage, great. And, and that's fun and it's sort of optional. You know, but when, if I live there, now I have no place to live because where I used to live is uh, now a short-term rental. That's not fun, and it's not optional. I have to, I'm being forced to go do something different. You know, so there are different perspectives, and some of the ideas and thoughts that we're having, certainly would, that we're hearing, certainly would all be taken into, uh, into account. Well, I would just come back. I wouldn't say it's fun to be able to actually meet the expenses of property. It's either, it's either viable or it's not. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, it it's becomes not a rental. Mm -hmm. So you you the the idea that granted there is a bunch of older um, rental owners in town that have got properties that they've owned for twenty or thirty years that they bought when they were inexpensive. But a new property you can't buy a single family home or a duplex in Yellow Springs for 
under $130,000, $140,000. That means you have a $1,200 mortgage. We, so the example of one of the properties we have is an Airbnb. It's a single family home. It's 850 square feet. It has one bedroom, one bathroom, tiny little kitchen, and it costs us $95,000, put $30,000 plus a lot of stuff, sweat equity in it. It costs about $1,200 a month between mortgage and taxes, and that's no maintenance. And so I would have to charge $1,300 a month for an 850 square foot, one bedroom, one bathroom house. So it, I, I won't be able to rent it for that, so I'll have to sell it. So I'll sell it for $150,000, $160,000 and it'll just be another expensive small house. It will not increase your, your rental properties. Because it won't, I can't rent it for that. Because just the, the nature of what rents cost in Yellow Springs and what property costs in Yellow Springs. I mean, unless you go with the home ink philosophy and subsidize housing, you're not gonna get any expensive rental properties mm -hmm. or any expensive housing. That's the way the, the town is now. Yeah, we certainly lo love to hear some magic formula to solve, you know, the cost of housing across the board. Um, you know, so it, any any good idea is certainly a positive. So that's what we're here for tonight. <coughs> hear all of these great ideas from folks who have a lot of real world experience. So I think the one thing that, that catches me is that I've listened to you tell the same story several times. Yeah, on the record. I don't know if we really have that much documentation on this situation happening over and above the one situation that you have talked about. And so it makes me nervous when the village gets wind of something that could be happening right away we go to the legislation. Okay. But it, you know, these are, you know, most of us are just normal people just trying to pay that property tax bill. Hmm? And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And so it's gonna have to start, you know, anybody who's already doing it is gonna be grandfathered in. So there's gonna be very little chance for anybody who's already involved. Number one, number set, number two. I mean, there, there was more than one example. But I don't want to get into an argument about that. I don't want to argue about the documentation. And and so let's go here. So there are 32 registered temporary guest lodging locations. Patty's shaking her head. Denise told me right before the meeting there were more than that. Okay. Well, so, we had quite a few just recently, um, and there's a couple properties that have. There's a couple registered with two, um, so we're at 39. Okay. So from the time we start talking to it, talking about it, to the time we got here, it, the numbers have increased. So let's do this. Let's go back to a time before there were any, there were zero temporary guests. Not not before we started registering people. Before there were any. Probably worse than that anyway. Yeah, it's probably there's probably never been a time when there has been that in Yellow Springs. Well, it, it may was, not have been full of people yeah. doing it forever. It, it was couch surfing on, on Sierra. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, no. Sorry. That All right, well, let's just refer to, we won't talk about it here, but let's refer to the history of, of lodging in Yellow Springs. Okay. So it's, it's documented here. So <clears throat> we could do a deep dive, and I'm going to stop talking because I don't want to hog up other airspace. But out of those units, however many there are, yeah, there were some that people were always at least renting out or, or just letting friends stay. That was happening all along. You know, but how many of those 30 some odd, nearly 40 places used to be just regular old homes or apartments where folks could live there long term? So that is the, the answer to that question is, how many units have been impacted, regardless of the families that I know. Well, there's something that you're not taking account of. Out of those units, look at the increases we've had in our utilities, in our taxes, and all of that. Those things that were affordable for the people you're talking about, in the time frame that you're talking about, aren't affordable now. It's not apples versus apples. It's like he said. You can't afford. I was one of those people that asked tenants to leave my place. I live, it's broken up, so <clears throat> they're two separate places. But I asked my tenants to leave because I wouldn't be able to live here if I didn't. I can't afford anymore to rent that place for what 
it cost me to live there because of all those increases. So you have to account for all of that, but you're not accounting for it. Those aren't affordable homes. And yes, there is a shortage. It's not a makeshift. There is a shortage for affordable homes. And that's not ever going to change because the amount of property that we have in Yellow Springs is gone to make that affordable housing possible for people anymore. And so you can't just put that on the backs of you know, the homeowners that are here now or the, you know, the people that maybe at one time could afford to do that. So I want to talk about, I think we need to differentiate, and I don't know, if, I'm sorry I came in late, I don't know if there was any differentiation between these 39 units, but there's a lot involved in these 39 units. I've gone through Airbnb, I've done a count, my count doesn't totally come up with, doesn't account for all of the 39 that Denise has, but as far as I can tell, only 8 to 10, maybe up to 12 of these units are standalone homes. Most of them are like Kathy's doing in her house. Chances are she's not going to have a full-time renter in her house. Or something like Ted and I have an accessory structure. Again, we, our math, just as Dan said, our math was based upon, for building that, was based upon transient lodging rather than a full-time renter. So I think we need to, I, we can't just say the number 39 and think that there are 39 houses out there that are off the market or 39 properties that are off the market. That's inaccurate. So, you know, I don't know if Denise has the information to better describe what each of those, I mean, I've got, I've got 27 units identified. I don't know what the other, the other, um, Okay, Ten I wasn't expecting are. that question. <laughs> so I just told you what my tally is, but it's about three of those. One is a uh, hotel, one's a bed and breakfast. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's probably about 36, but as far as if there are people are living there or they're, or they're not living there, I don't have that. I have to go back to do that. I've, I've got... That. What I counted was that there, may, that there are three out of town people who don't live in Yellow Springs, and I wasn't counting you guys, I counted you guys as locals, um, but that there were three that, that lived completely out of town, um, not in, even in the area. I would agree with that. And I had spoken to two people that simply filled out paperwork just because they were thinking about doing that, because they had a spare room in their house. So I'm going off the permit list, but I'm not yeah. going off the Right, right. Once, once, it, once, I, once the permit comes to me, it goes elsewhere and um, the finance director deals with it. So I don't know as far how active the, they are. My wife and I are actually owners who don't live in town in no. Columbus, so if there's any perspectives on that end, if we're dealing with the group, we're happy to mm -hmm. tell you our experience. Oh, well, tell you, tell us of your experience. Yeah. Well, we, we bought it about six months ago. Um, we probably spend an average of one to two weekends in town a month, so we don't live here, but we come quite often since we're just in Columbus. And it's been a good experience so far. It's mostly people that are coming in for yoga retreats or events at the university or families are stopping through town. So they're good renters and I'm sure are spending a lot of money in town for tourist dollars and we'll pay the tax, of course, to go along with the income we get from it. But it's been a good experience so far. So that's the thing to really look at is how much income do all these people come into town? I mean, everybody who stays at our Airbnb Go, I mean, almost all of them, not cook, you know, they're in the kitchen. They go to the restaurants, they go to all the different events, they come here for retreats, they come here for workshops, they come here for competitions. Yeah. And they're all of those people are bringing money into town and, and making Yellow Springs a thriving town. And it is, it, it is a, it's a tourist town, and that's the reason it's thriving. And this supports that. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, for those of you who are uh, transient guest lodgers, uh, owners, how, how many people or, or what percentage of your uh, contracts are with Airbnb versus like VRBO or you know, next guys down the line? Like, like, well, um, is, that, is that important? There's a reason why I asked, and it's about. Um, uh, the way the taxes are. Because I'd like to add something to the last conversation.
sure. to that. Sure. Because I think this is such a complicated issue. And that I agree with you. And that as a retired teacher, of course I'd rather live in my house all by myself and my dog. But I, in order to live here now and stay here, I need that income. And nobody's getting rich going to the bank every month off Airbnb. I mean, and it's, it's been a super positive experience for me to meet all the wonderful people who come to this town. And it makes me love the town more because I forget what they say, how they enjoy it. And I just have to get this off my chest. But it's very upsetting when my guests read the newspaper and people are so hostile to the tourists or their letters to the editor. I've had a couple of people read those and they say, because we're, we have the reputation of being a welcoming uh, a town with open arms and lots of times there's hostility in the paper to these people who are like here for a yoga retreat, who are here because they, their mother loves the Glen and she died and that they come here on the anniversary of her death. I mean, it's just absolutely uplifting spiritually for me and it sure helps my energy. So we need data. We need to understand exactly what the problems are, not just a general response. That's just my view. <clears throat> I'm, I'm also going to throw out just a few other things since I've been at rental properties most of my life also. And in particular, there was a property that we had in Fairborn that we finally sold at a wonderful loss simply because of the eviction factor. Um, taking in a long-term <coughs> tenant is oftentimes frustrating, to say the least. And you can talk to many of the people that own lots of properties, and they can tell you what a nightmare it is when you get that, that wonderful person that just completely trashes your apartment, or has figured out how to become professional rent jumpers. You're looking at three months lost income on your property, plus all your cleaning <coughs> factors, and then the village does odd things that are sometimes subtle, where they say we want to have the additional housing or affordable housing. But the one that stumped me was when they said we couldn't have separate metering. So, you know, that in itself, I'm not going to have a property that can't be separately metered and let someone just run the electric and water constantly. That should be an option, even if we agree to pay for it. And the excuse to say that it's more efficient to have the single metering is a case to me that is halfway ridiculous that it really takes that much longer to read one more meter. Um, I just, um, there, there are things like that. Again, they're subtle, but if you want us to rent to people on a long-term basis, you, you've got to add some incentive in there. you got to help us with legal fees if we have to evict somebody that did something that wasn't our fault. You can't make us responsible for grown people's utility bills. If they want to rent from us, that's great, but I'm not paying their cable bill, I'm not paying their vet bill, so I don't see why I have to pay their water bill if they become a deadbeat renter. That's yet another expense on me that I'm not signing up for. <clears throat> I'll add a couple of things into the, into the fray here. Um, um, I have a room in the house. So I'm, I'm one of those folks who has a, a, an occupied rental. But I'm also someone who very frequently stays uh, in Airbnbs when I, I travel. And more often than not, look for ones that are, are a single family house somewhere on in the planet uh, and appreciate that those are available when I go to pick a town um, uh, and, and as such I've, I've gained some familiarity with what other municipalities are considering and we're talking here about municipalities that have 
serious affordability challenges where, where a house would be four or five times uh, what one costs in, in, in Yellow Springs. Um, there are, uh, as an example, the, the city of Austin puts a threshold of up to 3% of the single family houses in each quadrant can be, uh, can be uh, uh, included in a short term rental system. Um, uh, just uh, as an example to throw out, I don't think that's, there's a particular data that drives that number, but I also saw the, the proposed amendment here in terms of, uh, of a ban on, on future single family um, short term, or single family homes that are short term rentals that are owner unoccupied, uh, and it struck me that that there's a disconnect between whatever the desired outcome might be in pushing that uh, and the likelihood that the proposed amendment will achieve that outcome. Uh, and, and, uh, and as such, I wanted to be here in, in uh, solidarity with folks who have uh, un unoccupied single family homes and, I, and say I don't think it's a, it's a particularly data-driven um, uh, amendment uh, and I don't support it. So, can I, can I just say, you know, so I think, it, from what I'm hearing, everybody's thinking that there's just one possible way of regulating that council is thinking about. And there are a lot of different ideas that have been thrown out there, and part of the reason for this meeting is to get your input on those different ideas. So, regulating the number of houses in a particular neighborhood or in a zoning district or something, that has been tossed around owner-occupied only has been tossed around, living, an owner living within the village limits but not necessarily on the property has been discussed. Um, and as certain, you know, but there have been a bunch of different ones and AJ, you wrote them down the other day when I was brainstorming them. If you have something that I've just missed, if you could read that. So I want everybody to understand that there are different things that have been discussed. There was like a time, like in town, Owner occupied eight months out of the year. Yes, a like limit on the number of nights. A right. limit there, was, nights. there was a limit on the number of nights potentially in a year. There, there were a bunch of different things. So if you have other ideas or other thoughts, I mean, council wants to hear all of those. It's not just this one thing that's being discussed or thought about. So um, there were a bunch of different ideas that were out there. So I just wanted to and, and what's the reason? I mean, I guess that would probably be this. Did you guys identify why this is being considered? Is it is it for affordable to provide more affordable housing, or is it to limit the number of the amount of transient visitors? And I, I think that council's idea is to see if it needs to be regulated. It's not necessarily the council is absolutely intending to go forward with a particular or it, with any type of regulation. The question is, if we need to do it at some point, what's the best way to do it? Is this the point, the point at which it is the time to do it? That's the discussion. It's not a, you know, Kevin brought the concern to council, and council said, we need to know more about this. But so, has it been identified? I mean, I think that, that the, the problem needs to be defined. Right. And, you know, I think that there are people that think it's a problem, but there isn't any data that really exactly. says that it's a problem. It's, yes, it's been anecdotally <laughs> identified, yes. Right. So there is no hard data about whether this is or isn't a problem yet. But this is, this is where council asked the Housing Advisory Board to look into it, and this is the step that we're taking. Yeah, and, and I think it's a good idea. <clears throat> it, it's, it's just really trying to be forward-thinking. You know, I've often said that we're a small village, but we have big city problems. Now, on a percentage basis, we're not really too far off, you know, from, I mean, Nick said, you do the math, you have little bigger cities. But on a percentage basis, we're not too far off behind. Um, you know, but we're starting to talk about the kind of things that you see, you know, in bigger cities. And before, it's, it's a real uh, problem. I mean, something that um, in New York City, for example, uh, I mean, they don't have a ban on single family homes, but they have a ban on apartments. So you can't use apartments because what typically happens is someone will buy an apartment building, 
you know, and then all of those units become uh, transit gas lodging, and you know, there's a bunch of places in one spot that nobody can live, but then they don't don't regulate single family homes. <clears throat> so yeah, it's just you know another although of a long list of kind of kinds of things that the cities uh, you know that have implemented those types of rules have done. And, and I guess if if we could do whatever's smart before it was a very serious problem, you know, we might be a step ahead uh, of some of these other places. I mean, uh, New York again, example. I think it was New York. I mean, it was like this. I can't even remember the number of, of fines that somebody incurred uh, just recently. Millions. Millions. Yeah, I don't know. It's twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, again, that's big, but but. On a percentage basis, you know, we can't necessarily say that just because we're smaller on scale in comparison to a city like that, that we would never have those those issues. I'd like to share a little experience if that's okay. So I own an apartment building that's commercially zoned, and that's one thing I want to bring up also is that can be different for commercially zoned property as opposed to residential. Um, I rented to people, you know, when we first moved moved into Yellow Springs, and had the same renters that lived there when we bought the building up until uh, about a year ago. And I don't know what it's like for other property owners, but the condition of my property has gone from trashed to pristine, and that's really hard to not, you know, take into consideration. The people who moved out, I did. I gave them their deposit back, and then ended up having to eat tons of money for landlords. I, you know what that's like. It's it's tough to say no to Airbnb when you feel like your investment's protected. And these people also are very concerned about the gentrification of Yellow Springs. And ironically, it's our being able to do that that allows my wife and I, whom she grew up in this town, to stay here. Mm -hmm. So, I think another point I want to make. Um, although I understand what you're talking about, New York and you brought up other cities, Barcelona, whatever. I think that it would be much more effective if we could come up with, you could find, because it seems to be passionate for this, to find other communities about our size where this really has happened. Because I, I think that it's, again, uh, to throw out San Francisco, New York, Paris, all these other places, um, I'm just not sure that that's really the best way to give an example of a town of 3,500 people. So I think it would be nice for you to find some examples of something more, more like Yellow Springs, just to prove that there really is a problem. And I think the examples are there. Mm -hmm. The little villages in New England. Well, skinny Atlas, New York. There's a complete moratorium on the transit lodging. Yes. Yeah. But is it, is, it is it because of affordable housing, or is it because they just don't want visitors staying in houses, in people's houses? I mean, is it, is it a safety it was, it was a, neighborhood thing, or is it's it? More, more on the social side. It was um, you know, not knowing who your neighbors are, uh, damage you know, to, um, to property, um, you know, Disturbing, you know, right. the field. So that seems like a different problem than we may be talking about here. Mm -hmm. That seems like they don't want the visitors there. They don't want the visitors mm -hmm. in the neighborhoods as they are here. And I, I mean, I do think that that it would be wouldn't be a bad idea for us right now. It's it's uh, basically a permitted use. I think that planning commission could consider returning it to a conditional use, meaning that there would be some oversight and at least the neighbors would be notified that there was going to be transient lodging in that the neighborhood. Was one I missed. What? That was one I missed, because we have talked about returning it to a conditional use. But that, that really won't have anything to do with the numbers, right? Um, because chances are, I don't think that I don't think that the argument against having them is that uh, against what would be that strong. So I doubt that that many of them would not be permitted and unless there was a huge traffic or parking issue. Has anybody complained about traffic parking issues with any mm -hmm. Airbnb? No. I mean, I know when Bob was trying was was working on jailhouse. I think some of the neighbors were concerned 
that there might be a parking issue, but I don't think it has been. I live across the street from Bob, and it's a non-issue. But it was raised. It was raised in, in the in the meeting, in the planning commission meeting. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, being new to the area and being new to the Airbnb in here, um, I mean, what have been the major community issues with Airbnb or the transit lodging? Any community issues? There aren't any. I don't think so. One of the one of the things I've been concerned about, maybe it's just kind of an emotional reaction that isn't based in reality, but is that these freestanding and non-owner occupied, I don't want those to take over my neighborhood. Right. Um, having said that, I tend to be open for business in another month, but it's in my house. I live there, it's in my house. It's upstairs, it's a, a new building apartment, the upstairs of my house, and it's never gonna be full, a full-time rental because we need access to the space for visitors who come to see us too. So, um, you know, what my concern has been I don't want I don't want them to take over the neighborhood. I want to have neighbors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen that happen really. So there's been yeah. concerns, but no major issues. I don't I mean, think there's any problems. Issues. No. And I mean, like you're saying, like you don't want to take over the whole community, and maybe there's a good well, idea of like there's there's a percentage of them could be blocked out, or maybe yeah. you know, there's once some of them go or have been sold off into a home. There's maybe four Airbnb more. units yeah. um, within half a block of my house. And I haven't seen any problems with any other. There's six within spitting different distance of my house, and I haven't seen a problem. But I wouldn't say there aren't people who feel there's a problem. Mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. aren't. It isn't documented, in my opinion. It's anecdotal, but people do feel, well, all these rental units are taken away by their being or converted their mm -hmm. beings. So and it, and it probably is putting pressure on finding affordable rentals. Mm -hmm. Do we know how many rentals are actually in Yellow Springs? Well, I between know. apartments and but the housing mm -hmm. housing, it's housing, the housing, housing study. Yeah, housing. it's in the housing. It's the uh, housing needs assessment that we had done um, last year, but I don't remember the exact numbers. It, off the it top has of declined. It has declined over the years, and it's at the lowest point that it's been in a while. But that's not you got Airbnb. Right, that's, I would. It, that's mostly the cost of the properties. It's just as, as you sell, you know. The, the, the dumpies that have got hundreds of rental units that have been here for 30 years can still afford to rent them at what would be reasonable rates. But as soon as those houses transfer, you can't you can't buy them and rent them for that. It's just not possible. I mean, the average price of a single family home nowadays in Yellow Springs is what, $175,000? If you can find one for that. So, and you know, it's right to home, you have to put how much into Right, and those, exactly are, those, are, those are houses you have to put $50,000 in. Sure. So you've got to charge $2,000 a month for rent. And it, no one's going to pay that. So you have to sell them, you yes. know, or some other way of doing it. Isn't this just part of a bigger problem, though? I mean, it seems to me from what I've, what I've been told, housing shortage is nothing new in Yellow Springs, right? So, I mean, this may be making it a little more difficult, but it, it's not really going to address the main problem, is it? Mm. We've opened up several tracks in town, but like if you look at on the Birch Street, for example, or you probably could have stuck six times as many houses up there, but we chose big houses. Yeah, that's what we want out there. Um, well, and, and, well, for choosing the well, yeah. <laughs> So you have to encourage somehow developers to put small houses in, and that, mm -hmm. that would be something that the community and the government could do somehow, yeah. but it well, would have to be financial. And, and in fact, most of the developers that we're speaking to these days are looking to put more homes in because that's the only way that they're able to make enough that they can afford to buy the properties. So, and I think it's because of the cost of land. Because of the cost of land. But I think it's important to note that, yes, we do have a severe housing shortage here in Yellow Springs, but it, it is also a nationwide problem that is growing exponentially because real estate is increasing at such an incredible rate nationwide. And, um, you know, for instance, I, the, the area I grew up in is a rural area. It's still a township. It's still farms and blue collar. And I cannot believe the price of the land there now. 
it's just incredible, and I would never have believed it would get to those prices in my lifetime. It's not as high as Yellow Springs, but it's getting darn close. So this Airbnb is just one of those additional problems that factors into that, that problem that is created nationwide, but very much so here in Yellow Springs from what we see with the housing needs assessment and just all the information that we have. Um, it's just one of those pieces, but it's a piece that we do need to look at, I think. Just, if, if nothing else, to be a little bit ahead of the game and thinking about, it may be this problem that we have to look at at some point. If it becomes a problem. Right, yeah. it may be, yes. And I, I think that we also don't want to lose sight of the fact that there, right now, is a reason that people want these these transient lodging facilities here. Ever since uh, before the motel was built, the hotel was built and I had the motel, I was just, I was always packed and there just weren't enough, there just weren't enough rooms in this town. Even though my parents have been renting out a room in our house since the 70s. And then my mother, when she moved over to Elm Street, she had a nice little semi-separate apartment in her house. And she always had that full. It was long before Airbnb invented. So it's it's been out there. Um, but I, I, I think we wanna just remember that that again there are reasons that people really like to come to this town and I would hate to push them away um, and say, no, we, we don't want you to come here. I mean, we really want affordable housing, we can look at a lot of communities around us and I can tell you how to do it. And it's the pool and rip out the playgrounds and start limiting other entertainment venues, um, don't repair the streets. Um, we, can, we can turn this town affordable pretty fast. You can see around us a lot of small towns that really struggle. I went to uh, one of the towns up north on 68 went to their street fair, which consisted of a small band on a trailer and four booths. That was their annual street fair. Well, as recent investors, that's what I was just going to say, the town, you guys have made a town that people want to come to, and that's, that's why we did what we did. And I was going to ask, with the huge fairs that you have, where is the housing for the tourists? I mean, I hear, I hear the restaurant, I understand that you have 50,000 people in a weekend. Where do they go? If they're if they're, if they're, if they're yeah, it's, it's, it's a one day thing. They come oh, okay. in and then they go back. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of them come and stay. Yeah. 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 They stay as many as they can. They stay with friends. The people running the booths want to stay here because they have to set up for right. 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 A lot of people are out of town. Hotels out of town. Springfield's in I I'd like to make another point. Um, I don't have an Airbnb and and never did have one. I don't manage one, and at this point, I don't see that I'll do one in my future. But I would like, I do have a vested interest. I have uh, one daughter here, Keith is back there, my son-in-law, who has Airbnbs. I had a son here up until last summer who had an Airbnb uh, separate from his home, but on, on the property. And I would like this committee and council to please quit citing anecdotal information unless you are absolutely certain it's a fact. Because a lot of that is on Facebook, and I happen to know from personal experience, because it was about me, <laughs> that it's inaccurate. It said I owned an Airbnb and went on to talk about um, you know, because not being able well. to afford the bills, which is absolutely silly. And uh, what I hear this, when, I, when you make your regulations, I would really like to see something that's factual. And that sometimes doesn't happen in these things. So, um, I, I agree with you. I'm sorry, I'm being very frank. No, 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 I agree, I agree with your point, but uh, I mean, I don't know that I don't know I don't recall anything that council has done like in that regard. Like anything about anyone in particular 
Well, but no, no you, you were just saying that, that they, when you when you brought up the point that one of the reasons for doing this was that mm -hmm. people were being thrown out of their their homes, mm -hmm. in their long term rentals, to turn them into Airbnb. And we have an example of that is that if she didn't turn into Airbnb, she would have had to leave the town because she couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good, you know, you are the owner of the property. If you can't make enough rent to, to pay the mortgage and pay the bills, then you've got to do something else or leave town. Mm -hmm. Well, all, all that meant is she would have had to leave town and the house would have gone up for sale and been one of those $200,000 houses that wouldn't be a rent mm -hmm. This wasn't actually targeted to your statement. It's targeted to council in general, this committee in particular, to look at the facts, try to dig them out, try to fish out what the problems are, and react to that instead of reacting to pressure that's anecdotal. And I've seen that. Mm -hmm. I've lived here since 1979, and before that I lived here in 69 to 71. I've seen this over and over a lot. And it's hard to sit back and see this happen every time there's a huge issue. So I'm asking, please react with facts and learn what they are. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that the, the, on the little house that we have, the woman that lived there, that, that had to move out because we bought it and, and we're re rehabbing it, is unhappy about losing her house. But the people who owned the house sold it, and for what they sold it, even if I had done nothing to it, I couldn't let her rent it for $600 a month. I can't afford to subsidize somebody's rent. And she wouldn't have been able to afford the nine hundred dollars a month I would have had to charge her versus the twelve hundred dollars a month that would have to charge somebody after it's been rehabbed and all the I mean the house is about to fall down. So and it's the risk of, of living in a rental home. Yeah. If you don't want to have the risk of being evicted right. to I mean, and, and purchase a home. Than once, but not for Airbnb because they only wanted to do something different. So it's um it's not an unusual problem if you're a renter that you may be asked to leave. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a lease, you, you know, don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's Airbnb causing that. Uh, I think that Karen's point was, was wise in terms of uh, council evaluating what it hopes to accomplish by, by considering regulations on this. And, and, and if the issue is kind of what does the social fabric of the community look like, then, then the, uh, I think it suggests a, a, some data-driven inquiry about where the tipping point is in terms of what fraction of the homes in the community uh, could, could grow to become transient lodging before we lose ourselves. Uh, and it's it's some number, and it's probably some number that's quite a bit higher than the than the than three dozen uh, that it is now. Um, uh, and and if the if the issue is more preservation of affordability, my feeling is probably going to have to look elsewhere. Um, um, and um, uh, the the one the one category that might that might involve transient lodging are would be apartments, um, and and those might be worth taking a, a different look at than um, um, than, than single or even multifamily homes. You mean not allowing it potentially is? Oh, uh, I I personally would be biased against a, an outright ban, but I think that there's a. Um, to the extent that you're looking at something that's that's designed physically and structurally as a rental, um, that's that to me is a different category of, of, mm -hmm. of dwelling, um, and and it seems more likely to me that that the question is is that a short-term rental or a long-term rental? Do we have a definition of short-term versus long-term? Well, it's now transient, which is less than 30 days, right? Yes, yeah. correct. I would also be interested to know about the commercial zoning versus residential. I mean, I think that it is absolutely important because, I mean, we I think it's doubled. Would you guess doubled the Airbnbs in Yellow Springs in the last, you know, 
Um, probably, I mean, I, I so did a count a while again. ago, and it's higher, definitely A lot higher, higher than when I first started three years ago. So, I mean, if we have 60 data driven, I mean, is 60 going to be a tipping point? Do we have some idea in mind? How are we, I mean, if you grandfather everybody in at 60, there's, so I appreciate the fact that you want to examine everything, but I think it has to be so done so deliberately. And that's why I said earlier, it's very complicated. Because you, if you control, um, put certain controls on people, the very people you want to stay here will have to go. That's complicated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a linear solution. You know, there'll be some of this and some of that, and some over here and some over there, perhaps. But um, everybody I talk to wants to have an Airbnb now. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there does, I mean, to me, seem some logic to, to having some limits to it. And I don't see that there's a problem with that. If you then say, well, okay, we're going to cap it, and then go right back over here and say, but from now on, anyone who wants to do that, that's fine. Submit your application, let it go before a, a board explain why it's why you either need to do this or want to do this, and then have some avenue for people to try and do that. Maybe there's an area of town where it just doesn't matter if, if there's a couple more. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, look at it individually, review it. Don't just don't just do a blanket. Okay. policy for every single thing, say what we do is you, just like when you want to build an auxiliary structure, right? You would, you would make your plan, have an idea, go talk to the people, and explain your case, and see where it goes with that. Uh, maybe you might have to have some, uh, a few letters signed from your next door neighbors to say, <laughs> to say, oh yeah, we're okay with that. Well, also I think before anybody starts making up rules about yeah. how you're going to regulate this, you need to find out if you have a problem. Yeah. Sure. You know, because if you don't have a problem, then there's no reason to pursue it. What were the thing? why did council visit this at all? What were the issues that they're worried about? So the issues, a uh, couple of issues, one, Kevin mentioned it, was the worry that people will continue to lose housing due to Airbnbs, but then also, there's kind of the idea of outside inv investors buying up single family homes, creating Airbnbs, and whereas those could be, you know, homes where if a family's looking to move here, they would be able to move into a home. You know, so loss of community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that mm -hmm. other cities are taking. I mean, Columbus, for example, they have bans on. Airbnbs and caps on Airbnbs, so in certain neighborhoods. Um, so I mean, th those are the types of things that, moving forward, I don't, I don't see anyone in front of me and saying, "You are the problem," right? Like that's not the reality. What I'm thinking of is, at what point will we get to our neighborhood being like? Airbnbs from investors that don't live here, that are from outside, who say this is a cash cow, and this is how I'm gonna make tons of money off of the same tours that come here for all of you, for our community, for the, what we put into it. But then once that community's gone, I mean, it will self-deplete, because then what are tours coming from if the community is not here, you know? So I do think that the, if there's a, a balance to strike I don't think that it's right now, right here, you know, I think that it is something that we'll have to monitor and um, kind of see where it goes. I, I can't say that I am not worried that it won't happen, but I don't think that it's urgent to where tomorrow we're going to be taken over by Airbnbs that no one else is going to be moving into the community because they won't be able to get a house. But I mean, it is a, a situation that we should monitor. When you say investors, do you prefer investment firms or just individual families like my wife and I? Because we, we thought about moving here, but we own a hair salon in Columbus. We can't just pick up and move with that type of business. And eventually, we might move here in 20 years. So I think the word investor needs to be defined, too. Yeah, and I mean, that's where you're an individual. Do you have other Airbnbs no. or anything like that? Yeah, so the, 
the thing is that there are there are groups, and it would be more more or less groups of people who come together, buy up properties in in, in multiples, not just one house, not just one house in one little neighborhood, but if you have the buying power to, let's say, buy a handful of houses in Yellow Springs, that might not seem like a lot to most people, but in a town that's small enough, that can make a huge impact in a community and in a neighborhood. So I, it's not you know one little house, but if you have the buying capacity, which there are some people who do, that's it's, something. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a cash cow. It pays the mortgage, and it pays the taxes. Yeah. Plus, it takes work. And, and, and <laughs> it, takes, it takes work to do. I, 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 you know, I look at rental property as an auxiliary long-term investment thing. So we have a number of different rental property, most of it's long-term, and Airbnb. And, you know, we've got the, well, the one Airbnb. And that one just turned out when I bought it that we paid too much, much money for the house and it needed too much mm -hmm. renovation. And it would have taken a lot more to make it, turn it into a reasonable rental, and it would have cost too much. So it, it only, it only lended itself to that. So that's why we're doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't see any, Yellow Springs is not a market now, at least, at least what I see on the Airbnb thing of what people are getting at night, that you can make lots of money. You can exactly. make enough to pay the mortgage and pay the taxes. And, right. and, and maybe a little bit of supplemental income, but it's not a lot. It's, you know, 100 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month. And that's not the kind of money that, that large corporations going, I mean, if, if they're going in New York City and you can get $2,500 a night, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> but you can get, you know, $67 a night in Yellow Springs, which is, no. Like but sometimes you get eaten. <laughs> well, on street fair night. Oh yeah, occasionally you get eaten. But I think your point is well taken, and I don't want to live in a neighborhood where everything is an Airbnb around me either. Mm -hmm. That would be like not living in Yellow Springs mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we maintain the, the sense of who we are, whatever that is. Um, it cannot become just a tourist town. Well, maybe you look at a grid and you say, okay, they're here, 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 here. And maybe you say, well, and there's I, already a saturation in this neighborhood, so you're not going to have to wait until somebody else stops being in Airbnb until we let you exactly. be in Airbnb. But I, and I really like your suggestion, except that I think it's so, so problematic. If you have to apply for a permit, you have to, to be awarded a permit, not just paying your $25, which would mean that, right? Where they're really examining the neighborhood, the impact, a committee, I don't know. Uh, I, I have a couple questions. Uh, when I was on playing board, we were not allowed to ban any legitimate legal business. You could regulate it, and you could regulate it to the farthest corner that nobody would see it, which was certainly thought about for porn businesses. Mm -hmm. um, if you could come up with a definition for porn, which we never did when I was on the plan board. So I'm wondering how a ban can even be discussed for this town and how it's legal. I yeah. don't see that. I don't think anyone is thinking of an outright ban. Yeah. Well, it's been mentioned today. <laughs> it's, it's actually been mentioned here. So I just bring that up. The other point is, my husband and I own three long-term housing rentals. Mm -hmm. We pay the utility. We have three wonderful tenants. We mm -hmm. pay the utilities on one of them, all the utilities. On the other two, we had to charge, um, you know, a deposit. Of, rental deposit and a long and a utility deposit which was just about as high as the rental deposit yeah. and um, we were going to charge a pet deposit mm -hmm. or one of the other two although we, we didn't but we would have she has a pet um, is what could have been an affordable home mm -hmm. for two of those three is suddenly out of the ballpark with all those deposits. And those deposits, the only one we were really nervous about and kept firm on was the utility. 
because we're the ones that have to pay it and frankly the village has said they will let you know but that hasn't happened with us <laughs> so no they told us the second month mm -hmm. and as I say we have wonderful tenants so it wasn't too bad of an issue my point being there things happen slips happen we have to ensure ourselves that we aren't going to get a three thousand dollar bill because somebody forgot to turn off the tap yeah and then they leave so i think part of the issue is airbnbs are a lot simpler they get cleaned every time they turn over the utilities are on mm -hmm. one name mm -hmm. they're just simpler and and they're the village has priced the long-term rentals up to the point that they're, they're difficult. Mm -hmm. so, so there's something the village could do to improve the rental property thing, is reverse the philosophy of the, tenant, the landlord's responsible for the utilities. Mm -hmm. Because it just makes the rentals more expensive. Because the landlords, as when they were discussing that, have just passed it on to the, the tenants. And so the tenants have to come up with that money up front. Mm -hmm. it, no, it's I, just the way it is. Every increase that has happened on our utilities and everything, that's what they keep saying, is just pass it along to your tenants, pass it along to your tenants. You can't pass all that along to the tenants. Mm -hmm. And that's why I finally went to an Airbnb, because I couldn't pass any more of that stuff on. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't afford it without doing it a different way. Um, I'll make a comment also just on this document I put together if anybody wants to add to it or make comments about it. You might send me a private message on Facebook. Is that this TGO? Is that this thing? Yeah. Oh, and okay. as we get more concrete information, I uh, yeah. can make it a working document. I, I have a, a question um, that I can't, that I've been trying to get the answer to for three years. And uh, if anyone in the Airbnb community has the answer, in, in terms of insurance, when they live in your home, or they when it's part of your home, because it's a very complicated issue, and I've been back and forth with my own insurance company directly with the what they call it. not just the owner, no the the person who holds the insurance the company, the underwriter. Um, and there's a new insurance called Proper Insurance that's with Lloyds of London that is especially for Airbnb, but they quoted me $2,200 a year. So, supposedly yeah. Airbnb is supposed to come with yeah. yeah. million But that's extremely but questionable that's, because right. you can't see the policy. Exactly. And, and, and at least from what people have said is that it, it is hard to get Airbnb to pay. It's not exactly. impossible. You don't have insurance hard. if they won't respond. Right. right. And if you don't rent through, don't, if you rent only through Airbnb, right. that's one sure. thing. But most most owners of transient guest lodging won't rent only through Airbnb. Sure. Well, okay. one of the things that I have done is I, I had my insurance agent add to my, because it's for me it's a garage, and I had them add a, a home business insurance policy onto my homeowner's insurance, that I was running a home business out of my home. And it was, I think, $75 a year. Okay, so... I can't begin to tell you the number of hours I've spent on this, on the telephone and with people. I just got a quote from Central, who I've been with for 20 years, right, saying that they would give me an extra policy for more liability. That made no sense to me. So there's only one company in the country, which is the proper insurance, that covers you for everything, supposedly, if you have an Airbnb and someone slips and falls or someone takes your bike or and has an accident or someone's in the hot tub and they slip. Mm -hmm. And and so I but I just thought maybe somebody out there, maybe some of you know something. Because I don't feel confident with the Airbnb insurance. Yeah. So I had, I have the home the home business policy. Is that an umbrella policy? And I have that too. I added that. So, so I've always had that though because I've, I've got I've had so a, a child in my life that could potentially cause me problems, and so I've always had a problem. But that could end up being twenty-two hundred dollars then. Oh year. my no, my umbrella policy is I think. No, I mean total personal. So, 
probably mentioned the same thing. Um, let's get I just, so I don't know. Probably pay around 225 to have both the Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that, uh, we got State Farm, and it's not that expensive. It, it, and it covers, covers all, all. The business? Covers the business. I've uh, got the Airbnb in, in our house, Airbnb in my own business, and both of them are covered. Separately, but it's not. Maybe I should talk to your, <laughs> your people. <laughs> and look for on Facebook, look for the, um, there's a Facebook, if you do, you're on Facebook. It's yes. the uh, YS Airbnb hosts. And if you send me a message, I'll invite you into the group. At, at Mac Logan started it. So it's YS Airbnb hosts. I think we have a whopping four members in there. <laughs> I joined back to that. <laughs> I think it says seven. Oh. Right. Well, watch our language. Man. A little after eight. Does anyone have anything else to add? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, this is a, going back a little bit to when I first uh, joined the meeting, which was late. Uh, but you're talking about um, uh, different size communities that. And, and that comparing, um, say, carrots to yellow springs might not be feasible. Um, my hometown back in Maine um, is Bar Harbor, Maine, which has become, um, since the 70s, a huge, um, a huge tourist attraction, attracting millions to the island every every summer. And and I'm just viewing this from afar, but. What has happened, uh, because I've, I've uh, along with my family members, have rented in Bar Harbor in the summertime, I've observed what has happened to the neighborhoods. And uh, what does happen is a total disintegration of the community for three months out of the year. And then, and sometimes now four months, uh, because the, 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 uh, vacation time has been expanded. And I see it as, as just um, not exactly a tragedy because uh, people are paying their taxes and their insurance that way and the extra money, just like those of us who are renting out, uh, getting extra payment. Um, nevertheless, I just see it as uh, uh, for me, dolls. It's about the same size as as Yellow Springs. If you wanted to have a comparison, and uh, and of course the the amount of of tourism is gigantic compared to this. This is very mild. <coughs> Nevertheless, what it has done to the community is uh, just for me viewing it from afar, and, and I'm not I'm not privy to it. Uh, as um, a member of the community anymore, but I would hate to see that happening here. Uh, yeah, I'd like to revisit Kevin's question earlier because he asked it, but we yes, weren't sorry. quite. That, that's okay. I just I want I know why he asked the question that he asked, um, and the question that he asked is um, for those of you here who rent on Airbnb and potentially on other sites. If Airbnb were to collect your taxes on their rentals that are in the village and send it to the village, would that make it easier or harder on you? And I, I, and I will tell you flat out that council and staff are divided on this topic because for staff it seems like it would make it harder not only on staff but also on you as Airbnb owners to try to keep separate what Airbnb is collecting for you as opposed to where you're booking all the other sites and having to remit that yourselves. But there's a discussion as to whether to sign a contract with Airbnb to collect those taxes only on Airbnb rentals and then you would still have to remit on the taxes on the RBO or whatever the other sites are. So that's why he asked the question. So the question is, for those of you who rent through Airbnb, would you want them to collect your tax for you or not want them to collect? Is that your question, Kevin? That's, that's it, yeah. Well, I, I, I think that, the, oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, the reason I do like the idea that they do it is that then you at least do get a good dose of honest reporting. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And, um, and, and I understand what you're saying, because it is an honor system that yeah. we're trusting you to, right. to do that. They, but then again, if you rent on all these other sites as well, then... Right, yeah, I mean, there is a, a huge possibility that that just isn't going to be reported to you, but at least now you're getting something. Well, I have a big issue with the way that whole tax thing is set up in the first place. So, we can't add on tax. If, if I charge $50 for a room, I can't add that tax on, no matter how I do it, unless I put my hand out when they walk in the door and say, oh, by the way, there's a tax, you have to give me cash now. Okay. Um, Airbnb charges me a percentage of what my $50, and I don't get that. So in terms of my gross, my gross is what I get paid, not what Airbnb charges. So when I get that money, I'm not going to add on a tax because then I'm losing money. I have to take the tax out of the gross, yeah. back it out, and say that I make less money than what Airbnb tells me I'm making. About 6% of the people are going to Six? Yeah, because Airbnb is plus, oh, plus yes, yes. So, oh, that's so that's 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 then, cool. yes, so that makes the tax burden higher. Also, Airbnb sends me a report once a year, mm -hmm. and it tells me, so, you made a, a regulation about thir anything over 30 days is not considered transient, so I rented out my room for 30 days. So I'm not going to pay tax on that. Mm -hmm. So, but Airbnb sent me a yearly statement that included that money. Mm -hmm. So now I have to figure out how do I take it out? Mm -hmm. and, and then I paid half in the middle of the year based on my books, when I got the thick statement from Airbnb somewhere, I'm short $58, so now how do I reconcile that? So the whole system, the way it's set up, is not easy for us at all, and Airbnb doesn't have an add-on tax ability. So if you, just for instance, if you booked for 30 days through Airbnb and they collected that tax, and then you would be out that tax. That's fine. I'd rather have them Big. add on the tax, have a, a, a lot, if, you know, if they can do it. They, they, do, they can do it, but that's what she's saying. Yeah. So they, they do, it. Up. They do, they it, do it for down. big cities yeah. because they have so much. Right. Mm -hmm. But to do it for a little town when we've got 35 Airbnbs, and, and it would only be for Airbnb site. It wouldn't be for any of the other sites because they don't have, they don't offer similar service. Right. Well, we're just talking about Airbnb right now. I don't know if there's anybody well, here. Well, that's, here that's the now. question. I, mean, there, I imagine someone else does something besides Airbnb. Right. Somebody. No. We don't. We just do Airbnb. Airbnb. I, I do. I do. Yeah. I do. I do. I like standards. So yeah. Yeah. I saw that I signed up. I'm home away, but I haven't gotten anything. So that's that's the answer to the other question. I was wondering what percentage you know are Airbnb and what what are Airbnb what has right? been the easiest to use. I mean, yeah. I've stayed in both Airbnb yeah. and VRBOs, and by far Airbnb is straightforward, easy to use. So that's why I've used Plus, it. I think that we rate that and they rate us. Yes. So everybody's oh, yeah. fine. Oh yeah, everybody's rated. So I, I love Airbnb not collecting taxes because yeah. that, yeah. it would be charged yeah. in the tax. That's actually a good <laughs> comment to make. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a boon um, for us. <laughs> you know, there's concern about the neighborhoods. What kind of people are you bringing in? I will tell you, with Airbnb, when the people are coming in, these are quality tenants that you're bringing in because they are not going to take a chance that they accidentally left a sock in the dryer at your place because they're not going to accept getting a star rating that isn't five stars because some places just won't accept them if they have a bad rating. And so I, I know. No chargers. No, so we won't talk about chargers. Yeah, we bought the chargers. So luckily, I get a lot of guests that leave ice cream in the freezer. So, um, but it is one thing that I know for sure when these people come in, that place is going to look like the way I set it up. It's true. Most of the time it is amazing. Yeah, we had one couple that put more trash in one, two nights than everybody else put together. And they never got out of bed. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.